title of my message this morning is boldness of speech. Boldness of speech. Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 13 on down to 22. And then we're going to go from there. Peter and John have been arrested. A man that was lame was healed by the power of the name of Jesus. The Sanhedrin, the high priest, the priest, were all gathered together. They were, they were upset about what had transpired, saw the influence that Peter and John were receiving, and then ultimately because of what God had done and the words that were spoken, they threw the, these, these two into prison, uh, the priest did. And then they begin to threaten them. And we, we pick this up in verse 13. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they, gave, they realized that they had been with Jesus. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Uh oh. What we got there? He says, we cannot deny it, verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people. Now, look at this, y'all, verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since all the so all, so since they all glorified God for what had been done, for the man was over 40 years old in whom the miracle of healing, he says, had been performed. So one of the things that we, we want to see here is, number one, it, it clearly states here in verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. This word boldness is very significant. And I believe it is going to be more and more important as we enter the end of this age. It's important that we allow God to release this upon us. We fully embrace it and understand the value of being bold, especially in the culture and in society. This particular Greek word, it is the act of speaking. So this boldness is tied to speaking. It says freedom or frankness in speaking. So there's a freedom and there's a frankness. This word also is tied to the word bald. It's, it's open. It's disclosed. It is something that is open, that is closed, and that you can clearly see. The New Testament meetings, freedom in speaking all that one thinks or pleases. Confidence or boldness particularly in speaking. It is plainness or exactness of speech. It is openness. I talked about with bald, being bald, speaking publicly. This word here is tied to freedom and liberty. Being in the public eye rather, now look at this, y'all, being in the public eye rather than being concealed. This Greek word is possible, now watch this, y'all. This Greek word is possible as a result of guilt having been removed by the blood of Jesus. 
and manifest itself in confidence, in confidence, praying, and witnessing. It means to speak boldly or freely, to speak boldly. So as a Christian, this should be our lifestyle. This should be our lifestyle. It should be our lifestyle. There's a freedom associated. Now, let me say this, because I also want to bring this to your attention when it comes to this word boldness. There is, we see a righteous boldness here that's described by this particular Greek word in reference we see here to what's going on with Jesus' disciples. But then there is a boldly that is unrighteous. It is unrighteous. And I want to, and I was just thinking about this, and I wrote it down when I was sitting over there. I said, I, I got to share this part. I got to share this part with you guys because there is an ungodly boldness that we see on display around us all the time. So I want you to leave your hand here in Acts chapter 4, and I want you to go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Verse 18. We're going to look at verses 18 to 23. Look at this. So we see the righteousness. I mean, we see the the boldness that is tied to righteousness that comes as a result of guilt having been removed from us. And then it results by the blood of Jesus, which results as us praying and witnessing and sharing our faith, being open. But look at this. Verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of unrighteousness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, he says, for holiness. Now look at this. For for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to what, y'all? Righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? You are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and, to, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I was reading this scripture and it just hit me. It was like, and and as I've been doing my research on the culture, it is amazing how free people feel when they're not walking with God. And now watch this, y'all, and how bold they are to display their debauchery without any hindrance. It's like people will be bold to say whatever they want to say. They will be bold to speak their mind. They will be bold to take lyrics, whether it's on a, in a rap or in a, just a regular music. They, they will take and they will say whatever they want to do and they just pump it all over the internet. They have no problem with cussing you out. No problem with doing what what, what they want to do or saying what they want to say. They have no problem. And there's a freedom and a liberty there just to say what they want to do because, because they are free in terms of righteousness in their hearts. And so this is why I love this particular passage of Scripture here because it gives you a glimpse of what you see on the television what you see on the radio. There used to be, even in our culture, some, some form of resistance when it came to saying certain things on television. But now, it does, it, now it's, it's a free-for-all. People are bold. They're bold to say what they want to say, do what they want to do, put it all in the movie, put it all on the television, put it in the radio, put it in the newspaper, put it in, and just people are free in in their minds in terms of righteousness. But then I look at the saints, 
and we walk around with a muzzle on our mouths in terms to holiness. Instead of us being free and bold in who we are and who God has made us and how God has delivered us and changed our lives and the fact that we are slaves to God and and slaves of righteousness and that should be a part of our everyday life to talk boldly about righteousness, to talk boldly about the gospel, to talk boldly about who we are, we put muzzles on our own mouths. Instead of opening our mouths loud and sparing not we hide and then we we say well i don't want to be offensive but they've been offending you every day on the job but you won't say anything about jesus they've been they've been offending you every day at the at the at the party at the at the at the uh, at the birthday party at the barbecue when we get together Uncle Tony, he's going to bring his six-pack. And he has no problem with smoking his blunt in the corner. But then when it comes to us standing up and saying, you know, what about God and, and sharing our faith and sharing the gospel? In some cases, people don't even say anything to us. We just cower back and feel, and we allow the subtle threat, if you will. The unspoken threat to get us to shut our mouths. But that's not what Peter and John did. That's not what Peter and John did. And getting our message out is now, because, well, we don't want to come off as religious. I don't, I don't care what you call it, but you're going to hear about Jesus. Can I have an amen? And then, I, and then we become slaves of holiness and righteousness Just like people feel free in regards to righteousness, we should should feel free in regards to sin. And what happens is now it causes us to have a boldness in our lives and then we can speak freely. Frankly, some people are so, uh, they've so allowed the devil to capture their tongue. And what I mean by that is he's quick to get you, quick to silence you. But we have to understand that the righteous are as bold as a lion. And even when it comes to our speech, we have to be willing to push the devil back with the words that we say. Not just the life that we live, but also with the words that we say. This is what God is looking for. So when you go back to the book of Acts, you see that these individuals were in a situation where it was clear that they did not want them to speak any longer in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, they did not want it. But they clearly understood that these individuals were bold. They're frank in their speaking. They have a liberty in their speaking. As it pertains to sin, they're free from sin. And as a result, they're speaking boldly and publicly. And they conspired together to get them to stop, to try to get them to stop. But obviously, as we read down, we're going to read down in a few, that they they would not allow them to do this. Now, this boldness that I'm talking about, number one, we have to be willing to speak boldly against what the world is trying to press upon us, y'all. Go to Acts chapter, let's go to, um, uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Look at this. Let's look at verse 13. Look at this. Look at verse 13. Yo. So he's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. And it says in verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, he says to stand, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now watch this. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth, what y'all, boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, that in it I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. So Paul, in his mind, he's saying, I need you all to pray for me that that I would still speak boldly, that utterance would be given to me, that I may speak boldly, and I will make the gospel plain to people. And to me, and this is my prayer for all of us in this room, that, that we would speak boldly and speak as we ought to speak. I don't mean arrogantly, I don't mean pridefully. I still mean in all humility and from a righteous standpoint in terms of the word boldness that we speak frankly and we're clear with people and we're doing it, speaking the truth in love to people, but we're not allowing the, the enemy to hinder us, to stop us, to intimidate us out of the things that we should say or need to say to a dying world that's looking for answers that we would have great boldness. So this was his prayer. You guys pray for me. And I'm saying to you, you all pray for me, but I'm praying for you that God would use you as an instrument to push back darkness and that he would use your mouth, not just your hands. A lot of times people, they're okay. Well, I want to show people that I'm, you know, that I love Jesus and that I love, I'm going to, and we should do that. That's a part of the picture that we need to give and, and the proper expression of the love of God. But there also is a vocal aspect to this that the devil doesn't want you to truly embrace. He doesn't want you just, he doesn't want you to speak. He doesn't want you to do both. And for some people, the devil gets a hold of them to a point where, you know, it's, I was talking to a brother the other day. He was telling me he was trying to cast the devil out in his dream. And as he was trying to say the name of Jesus, he couldn't get the name out. The devil wants to, the devil wants to choke us out. Don't speak like that. Don't, don't release your voice. Don't give your voice. Your, your, your voice has power and it has weight. So the devil, he wants to silence, his, silence the people of God. So what we do is we learn to push back by having a boldness of speech. It is clear here that this was what Paul prayed. He said that, that, that I would speak boldly. As I ought to speak. So this is something that we should do. He said, this is what I should do. This is what I ought to do. I ought to speak like this. Well, saints, we need to do this. The devil is through, through his media channels. And, I, and it's not just one, y'all. The Democrats think that the, 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 you know, the devil speaking through Fox. And the Republicans think the devil speaking through CNN. Instead of sitting back and saying, the devil's speaking through all this stuff. Can I have an amen? Where's the voice of God at? But what we have to do is these people, wherever they're, they're bold in speaking what they want to speak. These rappers are bold in speaking about what they want to speak. These musicians, these singers are bold about who, what, how they want to speak. Rick James was bold in what he had to say. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell him, wow. Because you know you was up in the club listening to some. He was a super freak. 
super freak, he's super freak. <laughs> Look at y'all. Don't be ashamed. You're sanctified now. You don't got cleaned up. <laughs> You free now. Now you can laugh at yourself. <laughs> but you know he was bold. People bold. They just come out. But the Christians, why aren't we bold? We're free from sin. We should be bold in terms of righteousness. It should be something that just comes out of our spirit, and we are not being obnoxious about it, but we understand the beauty and the importance of being free in terms of what God is having us to say as we're led by the Spirit of God. Can I have an amen? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is also important because... We can be bold towards the world, but we also need to be bold when it comes to church. When it comes to church. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 on down to 4. Second Corinthians is a beautiful epistle because in this epistle, he starts to bring... Um, he's responding to the correction that he had to release in 1 Corinthians. So now Paul is responding and he's saying, he's basically reiterating his love for these people. He's also confirming his correction while at the same time um, helping to bring even more clarity into regards to why he said the things that he said in his first epistle. And in verse 1, he says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all, he says, our tribulation. I want to just stop right there. He says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. He says, great is my boldness of speech towards, towards you. He goes down. He said, listen, I, I, the, the way in which we have conducted our affairs, he's basically saying, has been good. We, we, have, we love you. We've given ourselves for you. He said, Great is my boldness of speech towards you. And he, he lets them know his love for them, but he's also letting them know that from a boldness of speech towards them, he's willing and he's open. Well, within the context of a local church, this is also something that you should sense from the pulpit, but not just from the pulpit, but also from one another, that there's, not, there's nothing covert about the expression that's going on, that there's a freedom and there's an openness and a boldness that we should have with one another in terms of things. Now, we want to be spirit-led. We want the Holy Spirit to, to guide our tongues. We understand that. But what we cannot do is have an environment in a culture within the church that causes us to become mute in the house of God. We should not. We should always have healthy respect for everybody that's in the house. But this respect should not, should not turn to, and we're going to talk about this in a minute here, to the fear of man. We want to be, we want to make sure that we have a healthy respect and honor. That's the word I'm looking for. Honor for one another. But it should never turn into an ungodly fear of man. Well, Paul, he says that I have great boldness of speech. He said this is towards you. He, he was willing to be bald, to be open, to be frank, to speak freely. And even when it comes to preaching as your pastor, preaching up here, 
there, there is a place where you should have an expectation that my pastor is just going to tell me like it is. He's not going to sugarcoat things. He's not going to hide it. I know that he, this is what he's going to do. He's going to get up there. He's going to speak. The preachers that are here, the people that are speaking here, they're just going to say what the Bible has to say. They're not going to shrink back from tuck talking about subjects. Some pastors won't even mention the word homosexual in their church. They won't mention drugs and alcohol and, and smoking weed and, and doing stuff that's destroying people. They won't mention it. But I don't mention homosexuality any different than I mentioned fornication. Can I have an amen? I mean, it's here. What can I say? I have to be one. And I, and, I, and I love everybody. But if the Bible says this is classified as a sin, then I have to stand up here and say, hey, y'all, we got to watch out for this. We can't do this. I love you, but this is just what the Bible says. So what happens is, is there's no, there's no, you know, we, we, you should have the expectation. There should be great, you should expect great boldness of speech towards you. Why? Because, because I love you. God loves you. God, just shoot straight with me. Just tell me what, what, what I need to hear. And I shared this story with you before. And, and, I, sh- and I, I don't like bringing this up, but I should bring it up because it's, I believe it's important. Steph Curry. I have something saved, saved in my phone that is a picture of Steph Curry with a caption in it of a quote that he said. Steph Curry can shoot y'all. <laughs> that boy bad, man. He, he's a baller. He said, but he said this. He said, if my coach sees that I'm doing something wrong, I want him to tell me so I can fix it. And I saved it in my phone. If, my, if, he, if he sees something wrong, if I need him to tell me so that I can fix it. And this is what happens even when the context of our local church, we want to be around people that if they see a blind spot, hey, just show me. I'm not tripping. Just let me know so I can, I can make the change because at the end of the day, I just want to do it right. Can I have an amen, y'all? But you got to shoot straight with me. Don't hem and haw. Don't hide. Don't act like I'm good and I'm not. Can I have an amen? But people would rather have them lie to them and call that love rather than tell them the truth and call that love. They'd rather you lie to them. Oh, you okay? You're, you're fine. You're, 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 oh, I know you just bricked 30 times, but don't worry about it. Keep shooting. you just bricking. But then they don't tell you, can you, can you, can you fix your follow through? A good coach is going to say, a good man or woman of God is going to say, hey, look, with wisdom, say, hey, look, you, you know what? You tripping, man. You think I'm tripping? Yeah, you tripping. You know, on this wonderful Father's Day, on this one, and happy Father's Day to all the brothers here. Hey, hey amen, y'all. But listen, listen. Hey, man, you tripping. You think so? Yeah. Yeah, bro. You're not, you're, not, you're not leading your family, man. We good? Yeah, we good. We sure? Well, you hurt my feelings, and I don't want to do I'm not coming back to church. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We have, to, we have to realize that that's part of it, but it takes boldness. Paul said he used great boldness of speech. He was willing to do this. Let's go, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and then look at this, <clears throat> because we need this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 on down.
Look what it says here. Now, he's referencing the old covenant versus the new covenant. The ministry of death versus the ministry of life. He says in verse 7, But if the ministry of death, the old covenant written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away, the old covenant was glorious, what remains is much more glorious, the new covenant. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use what, y'all? Greatness, boldness of speech. Great boldness of speech. He says, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Man, I love this. Our hope, our hope should be an anchor for our soul that also helps us. It stabilizes us, and then it, it further convinces us that we need to speak more boldly. If you really, now watch this, y'all. If you really believe the gospel, you'll speak boldly about it. If you really have hope in the gospel, you'll open your mouth to speak boldly about it. If you've really tasted it and have seen that the Lord is good, you want other people to taste what you've tasted. If you really know in your heart that you have been born again by an incorruptible seed of the word of God, it causes you to be more bold. It causes you to have such hope in your spirit, which releases a boldness in you. When you're seeing everything that's going on in the world, and the world is falling apart, and things are happening all around us, this hope of the gospel settles you, but it's not just for you. It causes you to want to go and share with other people. And this is what uh, the apostle Paul, he's saying this. He says, as a result of this, we use great boldness of speech, not like Moses who put a veil over his face. Because what he had released was temporary and that glory was fading away the glory that we have does not fade away so what do we do we remove the veil we're open we speak boldly and we're courageous about sharing what we know to be true and we allow ourselves because we have been freed from sin to be slaves of righteousness and to speak boldly about this righteousness well the church has been convinced to shut up and stay in your corner don't talk about your faith on your job. Don't talk about it in your home. Don't talk about it in the community. Don't share. Just keep it to yourself. Faith, your faith is a personal thing. No, it's not. My faith is not just a personal thing. Jesus died publicly. And he died before all the masses that were there. And he did it openly for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Can I have an amen? And the same way that you are not private in terms of, people are not private in terms of what they're doing on the television. Why do we have to be private concerning our relationship with Jesus? The devil has tricked people into thinking that your, my faith isn't just for me. My faith, Jesus died for me so that he could plant his seed in me and then I can bring forth much fruit. Can I have an amen, y'all? It's not just for you. Lest a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. So Jesus' desire when he picked you wasn't just for you, but there's people that are going to need you in the 21st century that he saved you for. You and I would not be here right now if God didn't use somebody to give us the gospel. 
Can I have an amen, y'all? They, and I'm so grateful that they didn't keep their faith private. But they opened up their mouth and said, hey, Napoleon, you don't even look like the type of guy to be out here cussing and acting crazy like the rest of these guys. Don't you know God can use your life? Don't you know God can use your life? And some people in our communities, in our neighborhoods, they just need one person to come along that has boldness and has a hope within them to stand up and say, hey, you know what? I've been watching you and your family. Do you guys know Jesus? Can I introduce you to him? Can I tell you about the Lord Jesus? Can I help you see that he has the answer for your life. I know you got money and I know you got cars and I know you got stuff. But man, you need Jesus. I, I know you're broke. I know you're disgusted and busted and you don't have nothing. And you think if you could just get something. But even in your, in your broken condition, like, do you know Jesus? You, Jesus, he wants to change your life. This is what happens. And so this is how we get it, saints. Go to Acts chapter 4. This is how we lock into this. And we allow God God to use us. Acts chapter 4, verse verse 17. And we're going to read this on down. 17 on down to 22. He said, for so, it, for so that it spreads no further, we've already read this, among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. The man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of the healing had been performed. Number one, if we're going to tap into this boldness, we have to be willing to confront the fear of man. Just write it down. We have to be willing to confront the fear of man. Peter and John in this, in this moment are threatened by people that are in authority and told to not speak in the name of Jesus. Well, they were confronted in this moment and they had the right response. One of the reasons why we have such a hard time being bold is because we have embraced the fear of man. We're more concerned about how people feel than we are how God feels. And we choose to set aside our honor for God for the honor of man. And as a result of that, God can't really use us because fear has torment. Fear paralyzes. Fear stops us from speaking those things which we know to be true. We want to give honor to whom honor is due. We want to be respectful. We want to be, but at the same time, we want to be led by God's Spirit. Peter and John were not arrogant in this moment. They weren't belligerent. They didn't come out them and say, threaten them back. And they didn't get in their face. And they didn't do all that stuff. They just simply asked them a question. Am I supposed to, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, am I supposed to listen to you more than I listen to God? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Come on now. They, they weren't willing to do that. And it's the same thing for us when it comes to our walk with God. We have to confront the fear of man. There's going to be moments when we have conflict. There's conflict. Now, how do you respond? Do you cower back? Or do you say, listen, I, I, I've gotta, I got I to gotta listen to God. If you're having to deal with your children that are being rebellious, I'm not choosing you over God. I love you, 
But you're not going to get me to stop serving God and honoring God because of my relationship. It, it has to, we have to go there. We have to go there in the culture because if the devil, if he wants to get you off, he's always going to try to use natural ties or relationships you have to pigeonhole you and to stop you and to get you to shut up and stop. He will do it. He does it all the time. If the devil's going to get you off, he will try to connect you to the wrong people and get them to influence you to do something that's contrary to God's will for your life. And we have to be able to stop and say, whoa, 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 whoa. I have to listen. Just think if Adam would have just looked at his wife and said, no, nah, God said don't mess with that. No, nah, God said don't mess with that. We can't mess with that. Well, you know, no, 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 no. Now, you can, you can eat it. I'm telling you, don't do it, but you can, and that's going to be between you and God, but I'm not messing with that. Just think if he would have had some boldness, some boldness. So, nah, man, that's not the Lord, and don't try to pressure me to make it seem like it's God. I don't want that. And you need to stop talking to that snake over there, too. <laughs> Can I have an amen? Yeah. Can I have an amen, y'all? Can I have an what happens? What happens is, is we have to get this boldness, and re- it, it, regardless of who it is. But this fear of man has been used as a tool. You know, a lot of people, they're so concerned of being canceled by the culture. And I, I just, I'm baffled at that. I mean, I, I mean, to me, it's like canceled by the culture. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying, I want to say this right, y'all. I mean, we got canceled 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to the cross, y'all. <laughs> right? Jesus served notice on the devil. That if you're gonna walk with if you're gonna walk with him, you gotta come out of the world and come into his kingdom. Can I have an amen, y'all? And so what happens is this is number one. You and I have to be willing to confront the fear of man. These individuals, they were willing to do that, and God responded. He responded. Let's read verses 23 on down to 30. It says, And being let go when they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand had and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all what y'all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus number two just write down the word prayer y'all prayer I want to overcome my fears by confronting my fears and standing in a place of righteousness when it comes to boldness But at the same time, I also want to make sure that I am praying because the way in which this gets settled in my heart and in my spirit is by God. My boldness doesn't come from a seat of pride, arrogance, own willpower, my own attitude and my personality. I'm not talking about your personality. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about something that is divine, 
that comes upon you and is in you because you've chosen to confront, but you've also chosen to pray. And so they're asking God to give them something. They're not saying they already have it. They're saying, God, grant to us Give to us both. We, we need this. And then confirm what we're doing by releasing your hand, the power of God. Release the power of God to confirm what we're doing. And, but this all starts with prayer. It's hard to be bold if you don't have a prayer life. They had taken note that they had been with Jesus. When you start getting along with Jesus, it starts to stir up a boldness within your spirit. What's on him starts to get off on you. It starts to rub on you. It starts to become a part of your lifestyle when you get around Jesus. When you start to pray, even when you start to pray, Lord, how do you think I should attack this situation on here? Give me some boldness, but teach, give me some wisdom on how to say this effectively and to do it under the inspiration of your spirit. I still need you to guide my words. Use my words like an instrument, Lord. Break up the fallow ground. Use me as an instrument. And it's not your personality, saints. It's not your, your upbringing. It's not how you were raised. It comes from God. And then God begins to move through you, and he gives you the frankness of speech and the boldness. John the Baptist had this, y'all. He spoke to Herodias, and he told her. He said, listen, this is y'all sinning. He, he, straight, he just told them straight up what was going on. He didn't say it in a, ma in, in a manner that was unworthy, but she didn't like it. And that was okay, but she heard the truth. It, 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 it did cost him something. And for some of us, we're not willing to speak because it could have a negative effect on our bank account. Well, if I say that, then they might, they might, they might, you know, they might let me go around here if I, if I really just tell it like it is. They might. Need. And then what we do is we think then what we'll say is, well, I don't want to say nothing, you know, because I want to be wise. No. You're just being afraid. Because the Holy Spirit has been telling you to say something about it for the last six months. I'm prophesying to somebody. I'm prophesying to somebody in this room. God's been telling you, say something. But what happens is, what happens is here we see that their prayer life, help, prayer was used as an instrument to settle and to reconfirm and then to get the person in the right spot. And for us, we want to make sure if we're going to overcome our fear of man, we have to have a prayer life. Get along with Jesus. Get along with Jesus. Allow Jesus to free you. And to cause you to be open and to be bold, Jesus will do it. This is what they did. They didn't get up and start picketing. We, we, we've substituted prayer for picketing. We used to, man, something's going on in the culture. We need to pray. We need to fast. We need to seek God. We need to get before his face. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my faith. God gives us the, the, the remedy. These individuals, as soon as they got out, they went right into prayer. They got out and they went right in. They went right into prayer. And as they begin to pray, God begins to move. And what happens? The change doesn't immediately happen out there. The change started happening in here. Can I have an amen, y'all? Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with what, y'all? With boldness. This is number three. Just write down. We need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We need to confront the fear of man. We have to make sure that we're praying, but then we need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Our creativity, our ingenuity, our, our willingness to stand out and step out and all these other things are not the things that's going to tip the scale in our favor. We need the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And some of us in this room, we've been allowing the devil to handcuff our voice and we have to say, Holy Spirit, I need you to take hold of my tongue. I need the holiness, the, the, the Holy Spirit to come upon me to give me a boldness so that I step out and I don't allow my fear of man to consume me, that I'm willing to face it. Well, this is what happened for them. And then we see as the church progresses that there is just, there's, there's something that came upon the people of God. And the church in the 21st century, we need this outpouring again. The devil is radical, he is bold, he is consistent, he is persistent in releasing his diabolical messages over our kids, over our, the young adults, over the, the older generations. He's pushing his message on all fronts and the church needs to stand up and say, you know what, whatever sphere of influence I have, I'm going to be bold in telling people about my Jesus. Can I have an amen, y'all? This is what we need. And I want to say this as we close this message out. There is such a cultural uniting that's taking place. It's what I call an unholy union. An unholy confederation and it's designed ultimately to cripple the church and to shut the mouth of the church so that the antichrist can emerge and his voice can be heard his voice will be more prevalent as we approach the end of the age if we continue to allow the devil to silence the true voice of God And the stage is being set, and it's being set all around us, but as a church community, we don't see it. We just, we just well, you know, you know, and we get caught up in these things that really are trying to stifle our voice and the truth of God's gospel that needs to go out. And instead of us sticking to the basics of what Christianity is all about, you guys hear me say this, we start to get all of our creativity and ideas from what the world is doing. And so now we look up and our churches have just become entertainment centers. Because we've listened to the voice of the enemy that says, hey, why don't you just water it down, cool it down, and just chill so, so it, doesn't be, it doesn't come off so, uh, as offensive. The gospel at its core is, a, is offensive. It's saying, God is saying, you and I are wrong, and we need help, and we need to change, and the only change that he has given is through his son, Jesus Christ, and no man can come to the Father except through him. Can I have an amen, y'all? And the only way you can get him is that first you've got to do what? It starts with an R, y'all. Repent. But that's offensive. Some people are, repent about what, brother? Don't you see my car? Well, that's what, that's what happens. Well, the devil has convinced us that that message that was communicating in the beginning isn't what's needing in the 21st century, so just shut up and don't tell people that. And so we look up, and we have churches that are full of people, but the people don't know God. They just go to church. I'm a good brother. I'm a good brother. Didn't you see what I put in the offering bucket? I'm preaching now. But we need voices 
like yours. Every single one of you, not just me. Every single, we need voices like yours to stand up with boldness and say, everybody needs God. Amen. All of us need to repent and starting with me. And then we need to get right with God because judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Then it spreads apart. So if we get, if we start getting ourselves right and get back on our grind out here in these streets, preaching the gospel, then what happens, y'all, is that the world has an alternative. You see that small little beacon of light over there? I, I need to get to that. That, you see that small little beacon of light? I can see it. There's all kinds of dark. Oh, man, I just feel the anointing on this, y'all. There's all kinds of darkness all around. But if I could just get to that, I, I just hear them talking about Jesus, and they're, they're crying aloud. They're not sparing, and they're doing it. They don't care. They're, they're not trying to worry about everybody's feelings. They just want to preach the gospel and help people get right with God. Did you hear them? I heard it, man. It hurt me, but then it healed me. It made me feel bad, but then it made me feel good. It changed me, and then it just really changed me. It, it, it can I have an amen, y'all? That's where I want to go. I want to go with it. I can see God moving. But don't you see all this darkness? I see the darkness, but I can see this flicker of light. And I'm telling you, saints, God is raising up churches that are light in the midst of darkness. We have to be willing to hear the message that's being communicated and then also Purpose in our hearts that we are going to speak boldly as we ought to speak. Father, I just prayed this morning. That as this world is getting darker, you would cause us to be even bolder. Lord, in your mind, it's not a numbers game. You're not impressed with the numbers. You, can, you are thinking about the character and quality of the people that are sitting in your presence. Father, I just pray this morning that you would help us to become so bold that we would not be arrogant or prideful, but our hope would cause us to speak frankly, boldly, like John the Baptist did, to speak openly and to be free from the fear of man and to let people know that there is hope in Jesus. That people from all over the world will hear a message coming from your church that is not watered down, that is not compromised, that is not shallow, that does not cost people anything, that, would, that, that people would get the sense that me walking with Jesus, I've got to count the cost because what Jesus wants is all of me. He doesn't just want my money. He doesn't just want my lip service. He doesn't want me just to come to church. He wants me to lay down my life and live for him. And I pray that this message would go out and that it would hit all over. That it wouldn't, that there would be no limitations, Father, of where your voice is heard. We refuse as a church community to get the devil to convince us to shut our mouths and to change our message and to say something that's pleasant and that, that is not going to be offensive. Lord, we thank you that that is not how your ministry functioned and operated as you walked upon the face of the earth. Like we saw last week, Lord, when you got done speaking, the people, they took you to the side of the cliff and wanted to throw you off the cliff, Lord. But you can't kill the purpose of God. And I thank you that for all of us, 
People may threaten us, but you cannot kill me before my time. You can't stop me before my time. You can't hinder me before my time. You can't get me to stop achieving God's purpose in my life before my... That, Lord, that you have a time for us. The devil doesn't control time, Lord. You control time. And our times are in your hands, God. And I praise you that, Lord Jesus, you turned around and you walked right through the crowd and you went on achieving our Father's will for your life. And, Lord, I just pray that you would give us such boldness of speech that people would have a hope that we would be lights in the midst of darkness and that when people want to know the truth, that they know where to come. Lord, teach us to walk in such love as we speak the truth, but help us to continue to have great boldness of speech, no matter who we're talking to, that we have boldness of speech. God, we just give you glory. We give you praise. We give you praise. Remember, Steve Wisniewski gave me, he gave me a Bible, and he had Al Davis's name. And I've shared this story many times, but I want to share it again because it's important. He had a Bible, and he put Al Davis's name on there. Now, most people know Al Davis, the former owner of the Raiders, his, his reputation. He was, you know, he was a tyrant to some people. And when he gave me that, he said, I want you to go up there and take it to Mr. Davis. And I, I remember looking at the Bible, and I was like, man. Man, I don't know if I should do that. I could, I could sense this. He was my boss. He was my boss. And I can remember this fear try to come over me. You better not do that. Don't do that. And I just remember just saying, I'm taking it up there. I called his name Peggy, is that his name, Deacon? I think her, his sister named Peggy. She called her up and said, I want to schedule a meeting with Mr. Davis. She was like, what, you do? I said, yeah, I want to come up with, I got a gift I want to give him. And I remember going up there and having to face, you know, these feelings. But saints, feelings lie, y'all. So I went up the stairs, I went in there, and I sat down, and, and I'm, I had it in a bag, and I, and I pulled it out, had his name on it, and, he, and I gave it to him. I said, I want to give you something that, is, that God has used to change my life and has been a blessing to me. I want to give it to you. And I'll never forget this. He looked at the Bible, and he said to me, y'all, no one's ever given me something like this. And when he said that to me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It just hit me as I was looking at him. Like no, He said, no one's ever given me something like this. And it was sad. So many people were so afraid to say something to Mr. Davis. They were so afraid to, that, that they, they wouldn't do it. And I had to confront my own fears. But to hear him say, no one's ever given me something like this. It just, it, just, it just touched my heart. How many people around you have never heard the gospel? How many people around you that you can go to our Bible bookstore and order a bunch of books and say, you know what, I'm going to give some these Bibles out to some people. You can give people Bible. Go to the Bible bookstore. Grab you some Bibles. Man, I'm going to give these Bibles out to people. I know God is trying to reach. I gave him that Bible, and I can remember years later, Mr. Davis had passed and all those things, and I was sitting on a golf cart with his son. I was sitting with his son in a golf cart, and we were sitting down talking. He said, you know, my dad he always appreciated that Bible that you gave him. Mark Davis told me. I wasn't even thinking about it. He said, my dad always gave that, always appreciated that Bible that you gave him. He said, I still have it. And I always remember that. 
Saints, the world needs to hear your voice. Speak and let the Lord use you. Come on, everybody, stand to your feet. Lord, today, we ask that you would rid our hearts from the fear of man and give this church such a boldness as we approach the end of this age. This morning, if you need prayer for anything, come down. But especially if you want God to release a boldness in your spirit, I want you to make your way to the altar. And let's believe God and pray that God just like he did in Acts chapter 4 that he would do for you, that he would fill you with his spirit and that he would give you a righteous boldness in this hour.